The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Scott Ewan. I'm the facilitator for Bioforum's Environmental Monitoring Workstream. Um, and the webinar today uh, relates to the work of that workstream, uh, where we'll, uh, we have some subject matter experts here to talk to you about a standardised risk assessment tool and a harmonised approach for selecting and defining environmental monitoring points. Um, we will be running a Q&A at the end of the session, um, but do feel free um, in, your, in your chat boxes, which you should have on screen as well, do feel free to post questions there and we will pick those up at the end of the presentation. Um, for today's presentation, we have three, three presenters who will be, will be running a, a tag presentation here today. Um, we have, we're beginning with uh, Frederick Ayers from Eli Lilly um, in Indianapolis in, in the US. Um, and we also have Manshi Patel and Don Watson from Merck Sharp and Dome in uh, sorry from Merck wasn't get that wrong from from Merck in uh, in West Point in Pennsylvania USA as well. Um, uh, welcome to you all from from all over the world. And um, we know we have registrations here today from from all over the uh, all over the globe. You're very very welcome. Um, and I'll make that point again. Please do feel free to ask questions in the chat box. But I will now hand over to to Fred to get us started with the with the presentation. Um, Welcome and over to you, Fred. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for attending the webinar. Um, we're hoping you get a lot of benefit out of this. Uh, we've, we've been looking forward to doing this. So uh, just a little bit of the agenda. We'll go over some background and subjectives of Bioforma collaboration. Uh, we'll talk about the risk assessment tool development. Uh, we'll talk about a case study. We'll conclude everything. And then from that conclusion, then we'll go into the Q&A space. Next slide. So, yeah, what is Bioforum? Keep building that in that, please. So Bioforum is, is um, a very collaborative um, environment. There's eight forums all together. Uh, there's over 75 initiatives that we have. Um, there's over 100 companies that are involved, uh, close to 5,000 participants. Uh, actually, I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually at 5,000 now, because uh, we keep growing. Um, but the key thing that, that we want to hit on is, is the things that have been identified for those eight forums and those initiatives that were going for is that's trying to give the, the industry one single voice and using global collaboration, um, you know, across Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, North and South America, Europe, uh, Middle East, everywhere, right, using that global collaboration to try and drive um, change and, and working with those industry uh, leaders and experts um, to make that that change, right? And we're trying to drive, deliver, uh, we're trying to drive results um, by taking those practices, those best practices at each company um, and those ideas and, and putting that knowledge together and saying, Here, here's what we think is the best um, ideas for, for some of these things that we're, um, we're driving. Next slide, please. So, the Bioforum has an environmental monitoring work stream. Uh, my fellow speakers, we were part of that. Um, and we've been facilitating an industry-led collaboration since 2008. Um, we're very focused on modern uh, drug product. Um, in 2016 is when that started. Uh, we have 20 members, um, 20 different companies that, that the members represent. Those are listed there. I'm not going to go over them one by one. But as you can see, it's very uh, cross-company. Um, uh, uh, through different things related to the industry. And then uh, the output is available for everybody from a Bioform website. Next slide. Uh, so this slide's a little busy. I'm not going to read it um, verbatim. But the key thing that we want to hit on um, from a group perspective is the regular regulatory landscape, as we all know, is, is a little back and forth, right? We have FDA guidance from 2004. We have Annex 1, which is currently approved from 08. But as, as we are all well aware of, uh, that draft version has come out a couple different times. Um, and, and risk assessment, quality risk management, contamination control strategies are huge pieces of, of that revision. And then we also have USP uh, guidance specifically around 116, uh, 1116. Uh, we have the FDA guidance for Q 
Q9, uh, which is quality risk management. That's from you know 2006, and that's been like the foundation that's been laid, and things have have progressed since then. Uh, we have ISO standards related to um, monitoring itself and, and the risk assessment. How do we fit that in there? And then of course there's the PDA technical report 13. Um, and I believe, if I remember right, I think that that TR has actually been recently revised. I don't think it's published yet. It's in the review process, but that that is being revised as well. So lots of different things out there from an industry standpoint, and we were trying to take all of those things and then um, drive from a risk assessment standpoint. Next slide, please. So from an EM program challenges in the industry perspective, there's there's some different things that, that the group took, right? From a risk-based um, approach for EM, right, is is what we hear a lot of. Well, what's your risk-based approach? What does that mean? You know, there's there's some subjectivity to that. What um, I think we've all worked through the process of what we believe is risk-based and sometimes what inspectors believe is risk-based or or other colleagues at other companies, right? That's different and that's perfectly fine. It's how do we work there and try and drive some standardization. Um, and because of that, there is no exact tools that were available. Um, HACCP kind of needs adapted for all that, there, but there's a lot of different tools out there that were available. So we were trying to drive consistency from that standpoint and and harmonization, right? and to make sure that risk-based approach is there. Um, and then if we could publish that, right, that would be available for not only everybody in the industry, but also inspectors um, at all the local authorities um, across the world as well. So those challenges and requests can be very difficult depending on, on the agency and also the individual inspector. Um, and then, you know, the other piece of it is how do you actually manage that risk, um, especially if you're at a, at a company or, or a site that, that has to deal with multiple different um, regulatory bodies. Um, if you, you know, I, I can give an example for, for me, for the site that I work at, we've had one inspector come in that liked one thing and then another inspector comes in and doesn't like how that's being done, but that, that creates that, that difficulty and, and how do you evaluate the risk associated with that from a regulatory standpoint. So those are all the things that we were talking about as, as a group, a bioforum group, um, related to the challenges in, in the industry. Next slide. So the problem statement that we came up with was historically environmental monitoring programs were designed based on higher risk aseptic processes or opinions versus objective risk-based approach and we wanted to drive something different. So applying traditional EM design principles to barrier isolator systems can introduce more risk than benefit. Um, Non-value added monitoring leads to increased cost and resource utilization. Non-standardized EM approach increases the risk of regulatory scrutiny and non-compliance without a robust, consistent risk-based approach. Inspectors will take the opportunity to challenge. So the question we ask is why, you know, the question that, that constantly was asked from, from the discussions we were having is, is how do you justify what you're monitoring and what you don't? Right, so we were trying to drive some consistency. So that's how we kind of framed uh, the conversation to drive the risk assessment approach. Next slide. So the team wanted to say, well, what what does what does success look like, right? So we wanted to say, from a quality aspect per, per perspective, right, we wanted to have quality at the center. We wanted to ensure that we were taking the monitoring of the right sample at the right time for the right reason. We wanted a consistent application of best practices. We wanted to minimize risk of regulatory scrutiny and non-compliance. Doesn't mean it's it's getting rid of it altogether, but we're trying to minimize that. We wanted to reduce the risk by eliminating non-value added monitoring. Um, and then we wanted to create a foundation for continuous improvement and evolution as facility changes over time with different technologies. Because the last thing you'd want is build something that is only built specifically for one process. And then over time, as, as those processes evolve, it doesn't evolve. And then from a business aspect, right, we want to create an, if, an increased effectiveness of the EM program by eliminating non-value added monitoring. Uh, I think there's one more animation to 
move forward. There we go. Um, so the target condition, right, is we clear we we clearly uh, define global risk based assessment tool as for establishing um, environmental monitoring performance qualifications. So how do you qualify your environment from a risk-based approach locations, and then transition that to routine monitoring through your risk. And then um, that allows us to know how we've been successful. Um, when an inspector comes in and, and says he or she has seen this model before and trusts it, right? That's how the group will know we've been successful. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar this morning is to try and drive that. Next slide. I believe, Don, this is yours. Yes, thanks, Fred. Yep. So first, apologies to everyone that you can't see me. A little bit of technology issues today, which I'm sure everyone can appreciate. But hopefully, you can be as engaged with just my voice. So we'll want to walk through a little bit more of the approach give you an overview of what that looks like and Nancy's going to follow on with the case study as well and it's worth noting that we will be providing the link to the tool as well so you can look at it in more detail next slide please so these are the basic steps that you would take to walk through the approach and execute so starting at the top you would map the layout of the room. And again, Nancy's gonna go through this with a case study. So as you take this in, we'll walk through in more detail. So you would map the layout of the room. You would overlay that with grids within the room. And then you would consider a combination of the grids into functional sections. Then you would walk through the process with your risk assessment team, looking at any activities and detailing those out grid by grid. You would assess each grid against the risk factors, and we're going to take a look at those risk factors, and then score them and determine the relative risk. You would evaluate the results by functional sections to select your sampling locations and methods, and then you would move on to create your EMPQ plan. Once you've executed the EMPQ, you would look at those results and then you would consider how you would have those results along with your risk assessment to transition into your routine EM sampling plan. And then of course, you would review the risk assessment on a regular basis. I think it's worth noting, so this is situated such that if you're in an initial startup with a new facility, this is how you'd run this process, but we have also utilized the process for existing facilities and it works extremely well. Next slide, please. So I mentioned, and you could build the rest of this slide. I think there's two more clicks. I mentioned that we have the risk factors. There are six which we've identified that lead to determining the highest risk for potential contamination. So those factors are number one, amenability of cleaning equipment purposes and cleaning. The second is personnel presence and flow. The third is material flow, material transfer. Fourth is your proximity to open product or exposed direct product contact materials. Fifth is interventions or operations activities within the space and their complexity. And finally, the sixth one is the frequency of interventions or those activities. So for each of the factors, we score those low, medium, or high. And you can see we have the numerical values associated with those one, two, and four. The only exception is the fourth factor, which we did double weight for the medium and the high. So you'll see there in that case, we've included those higher scores. And to get the cumulative risk score, you would multiply all six factors together. So if you move to the next slide, you will see that we created definitions for each of the factors and what we mean by low, medium, and high so that they can be objectively scored in each case. And then if you move to the next slide, I believe this transitions to where Manchu will walk through a case study so you can see how this plays out with a real example.
Nancy, this is up for you now. Yes, yes, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so thanks, Don. Um, so before even we move into the actual case study, this uh, we're just going to talk about what is required before even you lay out, or before even you start the assessment. So first of all, we definitely know that we need to build a multidisciplinary team, and it is very important to have operational knowledge of the layout, process steps, and activities taking place in the room or the barrier systems to be assessed as part of the risk assessment process. So using the scale drawings of the layout, you divide the room into grids, which Don already mentioned, um, with the aim of focusing on activities happening in each grid. And the grid cell size recommended is to, for grade A is approximately half meter square and four meter square for grade B, C, and D. However, um, it is important to note that the grid size can vary or expand within an area to encompass grids with the same description, activity, or physical characteristics. Once you group the grids, uh, once the grids are laid down, you group the grids into functional sections based on the process steps performed. For example, grids within a filling room can be delineated into functional sections such as in-feed filling or stoppering. Next slide, please. So um, you can just uh, pop up all the three layouts. Yeah, thank you. So what you see over here is towards the left, you see the layout of the room that is in the scope for assessment. So it's a visual diagram. Moving on to the middle slide, middle diagram is where you see that the grids overlay of the room layout. And finally, grouping of the grids into the functional sections that covers the operational process steps, which you see over here highlighted in yellow that talks about the different functional sections. Next slide, please. So this is this is a case study here. Oh, you went too far, uh, too fast. Go to the previous slide. Yep, yeah, thank you. So this case study here captures the step-by-step -step guide showing how the principles and recommendations from the risk assessment process can be applied. And this is based on a company from the collaboration. So this is a layout of a conventional filling line within grade B room and a grade A filling line. What you see here is that the room is divided into grids for both grade A and grade B, process step descriptions and the functional sections. Each grid cell is given a unique identification number, which you see over here for the in-feed functional section that, compri that comprises of grids one through eight. Next slide, please. So once, once the uh, the grids and the functional sections are overlaid. This is the heat map of relative probability of contamination after assessing all the grids against the six risk, risk factors that Dawn mentioned in the previous slides, cleaning, personal flow, material flow, proximity to product, complexity, and frequency of interventions, after which you multiply and apply the scoring system to each of these grids. So different, what you see over here are the different color codes that are used based on the risk level to each grid. Red indicating higher risk, yellow indicating the intermediate risk, and green indicating the lower risk. Um, once the scoring has been assigned to each of the grid, you, there, there are recommendations provided in the paper in the link that will be shared with you for minimum mon monitoring principles based on the scoring system for each grid for both the EMPQ and routine monitoring. Next slide, please. So this is, this is just a visual for documentation purposes to show you the, 
how the final output is showing the description of the process activities in the grids in the in-feed functional section. Next slide. Don, I think this is yours. Yep. Thanks, Nancy. So we have been able to share this approach at several forums. And some of those include the 2018 PBA microconference, the 2019 ISC aseptic conference, and probably most notably, we had a face-to-face -face workshop with the FDA in October 2018, where we reviewed the approach and requested their feedback. And we had a pretty extensive question and answer se session, but we did capture some of the feedback that we received. It was definitely positive feedback and as you'll see they quoted that they do see this as a tool to promote harmonization and end fragmentation of interpretation of the current guidelines. At the time they encouraged us to look towards incorporating the approach into other documentation that they typically reference such as the PDA Tech Report 13 and I think Fred referenced that earlier it is under its final revision point now, and we actually have been able to incorporate this approach within PR13, as well as provide links to that. So it's also worth noting that the approach has been definitely adopted at several companies, including GlaxoSmithKline, Cicada, Pfizer, Merck and Company, and I know several others are either underway or already in execution. Next slide, please. So, to conclude, our harmonized risk-based approach meets regulatory expectations. It provides that objective evaluation where we've noted there's a lot of sub subjectivity. It helps to identify those highest risk locations in a standard way. It eliminates any non-value added monitoring, and we have definitely seen that as we've applied the approach. And it provides a consistent framework and even outcomes that we've noted that's very consistent as we apply, not only within a single company, but also throughout the industry. I think with that being said, we would have the link here for you to see where to access the tool. So certainly if you go to bioform.com, you'll be able to navigate, but we've also provided the detailed link where you can access the tool. You will need to register at the site, but it's the free access and definitely encourage everyone to download a copy. I believe that takes us to the question and answer session. Marvelous, marvelous. Okay, this is Scott again, and I, I'm not putting my camera on again because I will be flicking around between screens and that might be quite off putting for you in the background as we as we enter the Q&A. So um, before we enter the question and answer session, I just want to thank, thank again at Dawn, Manchi and Fred for, for presenting the approach and the, the case studies. Um, so many, many thanks again for that. So on to the, the question and answer uh, portion of the webinar. Um, I have received uh, just one question whilst we've been talking, um, which, is, which, is, uh, which is great. So, so thank you to Alyssa for her question. Um, if I read that out to you, um, so, so that everyone can, can hear this question. Um, so the question states, uh, our facility does not specify temperature or humidity requirements, but the EMPQ program recommends monitoring temperature and humidity. Should this monitoring be done if there is no specified acceptance criteria to compare data against, or should it be taken for information only? So I'll, I'll read that again. Our facility does not specify temperature or humidity requirements, but EMPQ program recommends monitoring temperature and humidity. Should this monitoring be done if there is no specified acceptance criteria to compare data against, should it be taken for information only? So that is the so, question. So Scott, this is Dawn. I, maybe if there's a possibility to ask a clarifying question of what type of facility we're looking at, what classification, I would say in general, I would have expected there to be oversight over the humidity and temperature and it to be alarming if outside of any particular range for at least grades A through D. Yeah, Don, I, I would 
I would second that as well. I mean, I, it definitely within a classified facility, I think at, at minimum temperature would, would be a required, um, you would have limits and everything associated with that based upon the, the facility design and the process that would be in there. So I, I would think from a qualified standpoint, you definitely need to have that, which is where the risk assessment falls into, right? If it's not a if it's not a classified area, then really the risk assessment doesn't apply. So that's the only other thing I would add. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Alyssa, if there is, uh, if, you, if you are still on the line, um, it, if there's any way you can add a, a, a qualifier to that question, just, just to, to help the team respond, uh, that would be particularly helpful. Um, so actually, here we are. Uh, so th thanks, Alyssa. So uh, the, the, this kind of response to that is, it's a grade D space. The AHU does not operate within a range, but there are no actions if it goes out of range. I'm not sure if that helps or not, guys. Well, it does, so definitely answers the question. I would have suggested that that would likely be an expectation that you would have controls in place to at least monitor and detect whether it's gone out of range. So maybe something to follow on with. Uh, certainly then I would, if that's not the case, definitely I think the answer is yes, you should incorporate that into your ENPQ program to evaluate that criteria as part of that, since those would be part of your controls. I don't know if anyone else, Fred or Manchi, would like to add. Yeah, and then I, I agree with you. And then Don, uh, because you know, you, you definitely want to assess that because you know you want to make sure that what impact it has in the other classify classifications. So grade D to C, right? If you don't have those controls in place for grade D. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, so we do have uh, some other questions coming in now. So um, I'll again, I will just read these out as they come in. So a question from uh, from Suman Saha: um, Is there any necessity to conduct routine environmental monitoring if there if there is no production for a long period of time? So is there a necessity to conduct routine EM if there is no production for a long period of time? Anyone want to tackle that one? So I'll, I'll take a little bit of a stab at that. Don Manchi, please okay. jump in if, if, if you think yep. I misspeak here. Um, I, I would say, I would say, you know, right, your risk assessment, what we went over today is, is what you would use to help qualify your facility. And as part of that qualification, right, you would be doing at rest monitoring and then operational monitoring. So I think as long as you built your EMPQ strategy, the sampling process to cover that length of time from an at-rest standpoint, I believe you would be covered, but I think there's still, um, you, you probably could, um, you'd have to have that, you know, clearly um, articulated within your, your strategy document. So, but the risk assessment that we went over today could be used for that site selection, for that qualification, and then you can use that that qualification process for, for you know, determining, hey, you know, during at rest, we only have to monitor at this frequency versus this frequency in operation, I think is one thing um, that you could do. So Manchi, Don, please add anything or correct anything you think I misspoke on. Yeah, so I would maybe have taken the question a little bit differently. If I understood correctly, you might have, and I think it could be one of two scenarios. You might have the facility still operational, but not running production. And for that, instance, we would typically reduce the frequency of the routine monitoring down to a base level rather than mm -hmm. where it might be increased on a per batch level. If it's in the case where there's actually no production and actually you're eliminating control, um, meaning you've shut down HVAC, mm -hmm. you've relaxed downing, things of that nature, I've seen a couple of practices. One, no longer carry on with routine monitoring requalify, come back into you know, formal control mm -hmm. post that shutdown period. Or I actually have seen more monitoring conducted during that time period to keep track of the area in terms of any concerns with the microbial flora that might be entering the area so that you can bring the rooms back into a good state of control. So um, if I understood the 
question correctly, I think it could be one of those two scenarios, and that would be how I would expect to be approached in either case. Yeah, and and Donna Dredd, I think when when you don't have any batch processing, and if it's a shutdown period, you, you there is all, all you can also reduce the sampling locations just to make sure the system is in state of control during the shutdown period. Yeah, yeah I, mm -hmm. I, and I would agree with that, and and that was that is a different way to take that question, Don. So I mm -hmm. I appreciate that, but and I would agree with what you were saying that you know based upon that shutdown or inactivity. Activity, um, if if it truly is, you know, you you remove the controls in place, then I I would definitely recommend you don't do the monitoring, and then you have a mm -hmm. you, you have a modified process, whether it's a modified qualification process or whatever, you have a process of bringing that area back up to its qualified state, and then you would have to actually have that qualified. So that's the only other thing I would add. Okay, cool. Just one one follow up question there as well. Um, can we conduct PQ of the environment based on room wise instead of uh, based on the AHU? Can we conduct PQ of the environment based on the room instead of uh, the AHU? Okay, so maybe we put our heads together on this one because I think I'm understanding the question, meaning if you're actually delineating the rooms that are supplied by a certain AHU and doing a PQ according to that as opposed to room by room, which we typically actually would look at it room by room. We would not we would have that connection to what is being serviced, what AHU is servicing the room, but we wouldn't necessarily qualify based on the source AHU, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if Fred or Nancy, you want to add to that I agree yeah I, I would agree Don. I typically how I've seen it and, and how we do it is is based upon room and facility qualification not necessarily specifically tied to the air, air handler itself we we know you know the the AHU which one supplies which rooms or or multiple rooms right we we know that we can identify that but we qualify those rooms on, on their own and not necessarily mm -hmm. specifically tied to, to that air handling unit. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, and, and it, So Don and Manchi, back to, right, so I'm, I'm trying to pull it back into the risk assessment. From a risk assessment standpoint, I the way that the document's written, it's, it's very specifically about the process in the room. So I think even from a risk mm -hmm. assessment standpoint, if you mm -hmm. follow that, right, it keeps you in that mentality and not necessarily focused on the air handler units, right? If you have a really big facility, you could have multiple ones. If you have a smaller one, maybe just one, right? So I think if you follow right. the, the risk assessment mm -hmm. process, it keeps you focused on the room and the process that occurs in that area and the evaluation of that. Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, so plenty of questions to keep us going now. So I'll, I'll move on. Thank, thank you, panel. Um, so the next question is from uh, Rafael uh, Linares. Hopefully I'm, I'm pronouncing all of your names correctly. Please accept my apologies if, if I murder anyone's names. Um, but the question from Rafael is, what is the amount of sampling that is expected for qualification before a classified area is used? Um, so what is the amount of sampling expected for qualification before a classified area is used? And then what about non-classified? So, well, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I was, I was going to uh, say that the paper, the link that we provided does have recommendations for, depending on the output of the risk assessment and the classification, um, we have recommendations for a minimum sampling requirements as well as sampling methods to be used uh, based on the output um, of the risk assessment and depending on the scoring uh, risk level. Right, exactly. So that's that's exactly right. Yeah, please. Yeah, please, yeah, please. exactly what I was going to reference, Nancy, is the, that the paper actually does provide a delineation on what the expectation from an EMPQ standpoint and where those samples are recommended. And to me, that's one of the high value pieces, it mm -hmm. really helps establish that a consistent approach. And also where we saw companies maybe being overly conservative and 
taking every grid and putting monitoring in every grid, that may not be necessary from especially a viable standpoint. Certainly for non-viable, you need to follow ISO, but from a viable standpoint, that's not always necessary. Okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, moving on to the next question from, uh, from Adrian Zimbelman. Uh, can this toolkit be modified to incorporate risks specific to non-sterile low bio burden drug substance manufacturing. Uh, the facility in question is primarily grade CD, um, but with no aseptic filling and therefore no aseptic interventions. Can the toolkit be modified to incorporate risks specific to non-sterile low bio burden drug substance manufacturing? So I'll definitely jump in quickly on this one yeah. because it definitely hit a chord with me because <laughs> we definitely apply this in the low bio burden scenario and we've adapted the approach to consider the definitions in that context so we are using it in that way similarly for non-sterile we've modified the approach maybe not so I'll say from a low bio burden we're doing that company-wide from a non-sterile we did do a singular application that does require a bit more modification since obviously these are intended for accepted classified spaces. The non-sterile had certainly different factors, but the approach itself can be leveraged and following that same approach and creating the right risk factors that might be different in a non-sterile application, it certainly works as well. Excellent, okay, great answer, thank you. Um, uh, moving on, um, so a question from, uh, uh, from uh, Prerna. Um, thank you for sharing the great approach in case studies. Uh, what's the best way to adopt this approach for low-level biologics operations, whereby most of the open operations take place within the BSC? So thank you for sharing the great approach in case study. What's the best way to adopt the approach for low-level biologics operations, where most of the open operations only take place within the BSC? Manchi, did you want to chime in on this? I feel like this is something we've approached. Yeah, so the the approach problem, Don, Don, in the previous question, she already answered that the best approach, um, um, when you have open, open aseptic manipulations, uh, and did I hear the BSC? In the BSC, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the, the process, if it's if it's open aseptic and uh, with a grade C background, I think as Dawn mentioned in the previous uh, responding to the previous um, question was that this this tool, the the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet, the a risk assessment spreadsheet is defined to use um, to be used for the background um, and the support areas for all this. Um, processes and that includes the BSC with uh, the grade whatsoever the background is. So yes, this tool can be used for those type of um, uh, processes that involves open aseptic uh, manipulation within the BSC. I don't know, Dawn, Fred, if you want to add anything to that. No, that's what I, I would say. Is... Go ahead, Dawn. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fred, go ahead. No, I, the only thing I was going to say is yes. Uh, to me, the 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 assessment is written in a way that you you can you 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 can adapt it to that that type of process because you're still. I mean, it's not a true 100% aseptic um, process, but there there's aseptic manipulations, as Manchi was saying, performed in that right. So you can evaluate it from that perspective, and it's just going to be a much smaller area, and then have. Um, and then have the the subsequent you know adjacent spaces you know managed in the same way. So I think I think it it, it would work. And yeah, and that's why um, I think in the presentation we did mention that the first thing would to uh, with, with depending on whatever your process is or whatever upstream downstream um, you, you want to make sure that the first and basic thing that you do is uh, start with defining and walking through the process. Okay, lovely. Don, Thank you very much. Add something? Yeah, 
I, I don't know if Don no, I, think you, something I Brian. think you both covered it well. I think you both covered it well. Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So the next question uh, comes from from Bryce, um, and this question is uh, well for, for grade B, C, and D in particular. And the question is, do you have a different approach for at rest and inactivity samples, and do you perform both during a work session? So do you have a different approach for at rest and inactivity inactivity samples, and do you perform both during a work session? Um, maybe one quick point of clarification because i do think this is important so the approach is intended to assist with identification of those highest risk locations this is one of our own questions i think that we would have looked to answer which is when you move to implementation how do you then transition from now i have my locations but what are the methods that I need to use and what's the frequency in those at rest and in operation conditions. So I just did want to make that clarification is we have some recommendations in, within the tool around frequency and types of methods to be used in the different classified areas, but the tool is purely designed to identify those locations. So I didn't answer the question, I just wanted to provide that clarification to start. We can move on to answering the question now as best we can. Okay, so just as a reminder, it was, it was a, you know, do you have yeah. a different approach for at rest and inactivity samples, and do you perform both during a work session? So, is there anything else to add to that uh, to that to that response? Mm, that's interesting. So, it's a, I feel like it's, yeah. it depends. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> one question. Yeah, and correct me. So, if I understand it, so when you say work session, does that mean when you're in in when you're in a process mode, right? Batch processing. That's the way I would interpret. Yeah, it that's well. that's mm -hmm. the way. And then, like, if you look into the definition of what at rest is and dynamic is, right? So they're completely two different approach. At rest meaning you just want to be in a static mode. So I I'm I'm not so clear, or maybe I'm missing something on the question. Because you're linking maybe, it with working session, yeah. So maybe a little more clarity. Maybe that given a high level response to say that for those classifications, especially D, it's largely a. So you would take those periodic samples. It may not be truly an in operation. It may be allowance for dynamic activity to be taking place but it's not mandatory that it's an actual operational whereas grade c you might have specific operations where you would delineate some specific monitoring and take through in operation sampling uh, the at rest sampling we should be doing on a you know qualification basis mm -hmm. i don't know fred would you want to add uh you, honestly don you kind of took the words right out of my mouth i mean that that's mm -hmm. kind of where i i would be heading as well of I think you have to differentiate what are the, and I think this gets back to the assessment that Manchi gave the case study on, right? To identify, you know, that cross-functional team that really understands the processes that will occur there and evaluate the risk based upon that. That gives you the selections that, you know, the, the location selections that you talked about before. And then based upon that, right, what what is your, you know, you could take the frequencies that are identified in the assessment document and then say, you know, if it is a grade D space that maybe is just a, a transition area mainly, right? So you're just putting something in and moving something out. It's not really quote unquote operational, right? You you have at rest monitoring there, but then in an adjacent space, let's say you have formulation going on in a grade mm -hmm. C environment, you will need uh, to do some kind of operational monitoring during that process. But then inside of that, you're also gonna be doing some at rest. So I think you just need to identify that, but back to the assessment, right? You're using that assessment to identify those locations. And then within there, you're you're using those frequencies and, and monitoring methods that are listed appropriately based upon the risk that's identified for that grid. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, guys. Uh, Keen, you still have quite a few questions to get through, so, so I'll push on, if that's OK. Um, so uh, a slightly longer question from uh, Cathy Zagaroli. Um, so so uh, I'll read this through a couple of times. Um, after a new facility gains historical knowledge, there's often a desire opportunity to reduce sampling. Has there been any consideration of how to utilise a similar approach to justify a reduction in sampling sites or frequency? There's a bit of context here as well. We are looking for a tool that would help justify a reduction, and this seems like it could be a good start for helping to justify the reduction by adding historical performance as a parameter. So uh, the first part of the question again, after a new facility gains historical knowledge, there's often a desire or opportunity to reduce sampling. Has there been any consideration of how to utilise a similar approach to justify reduction in sampling sites or frequency? What are your thoughts, team? So, uh, can I take a stab at it? Huh? Yep. So, we do have in our paper, we do, as you're assessing this risk assessment, we do have added additional considerations um, that uh, can be considered during scoring as well. So, um, definitely you want to take into consideration the historical data to refine your EM sampling locations, then evaluations of your ABS studies, existing controls that you have in place, um, as well as consideration of locations um, representing a risk of microbial proliferation. So with all that being said, yes, we do have, we do have um, stated in our tool um, to take into consideration the historic, historical data to refine or uh, reduce the EM sampling locations. Lovely. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, did uh, Dawn or Fred, did you have anything to add to that? I have nothing. I think Manchi hit it right on the head. So. Great job. Hit it on, on the nail. Okay, marvellous. Okay, so we'll move on to the question now from Anetra Wilson. Um, in our facility, we do monitor humidity and temperature as well as alarming them, but we only do this for certain rooms based on criticality of activities performed in the room. Some of the other classified rooms are not alarmed. Uh, in your opinion, the team, should they be alarmed? Do you repeat the questions, Scott, please? Sure, yeah. In our facility, we do monitor uh, humidity and temperature as well as alarming them, but we only do this for certain rooms based on the criticality of activities performed in the room. Some of the other classified rooms are not alarmed. Um, in your opinion, should they be? So my opinion might be biased because we are a bit conservative, but I would say yes. I suspect this may be for low bio burden type operations or maybe something not as critical. So I'd be interested to hear somewhat of the rationale because at least there's some basis there for criticality of the room. But my expectation would be if the room has a classification, you would be monitoring the humidity and temperature controls. Any others? Yeah, so, that you want to add? yeah, the only other thing that I would add is, is I think, right, we, the risk assessment that we were talking about is, is related to those classified spaces <laughs> and, and selecting EM monitoring points, right? You're, you're talking about other HVAC controls that help control that mm -hmm. bio burden in the area. Um, and I, I would say that you'd have to have, either an, uh, some other kind of assessment to say this room's going to be alarmed and monitored for humidity, this room's not, and have justification within there. But I, I would agree with you, Don. My expectation would be that that we're at least monitoring those processes. Um, maybe not alarming, but monitoring so you, you can use your EM data to say, you know, if you see a spike in something, you know, go back and look at that data and say, or is that related to something, especially if it's kind of a low bio burden process or anything like that? I think that would be an expectation. Okay, just just an update there that uh, yes, it is for a low bio burden drug substance uh, product is sterile filtered offsite, if that helps. 
Uh, and that's what I had assumed. And I do think there is an opportunity there, just the way Fred framed that. You know, have that rationale and explanation and supporting data that demonstrates that level of control that is needed in those non-critical rooms and then establishes the control within those critical rooms. Yeah, uh, uh, like I said, I think that's the key thing, and that doesn't mean that an individual inspector is not going to, you know, you can show them that rationale, and they could very easily just be like, yeah, that's great, I don't agree with it. <laughs> so, but I think if yeah. you have it documented, and it's just not, you know, how you do things, if it's documented and it has rationale behind it, I, I do believe it puts you in a better footing from a scientific technical perspective, but from a compliance perspective, I think you still might be open a, a little bit based upon, you know, either individual inspectors' expectations related to, the, to that type of monitoring. I guess one other thing maybe to add to that is, it's not as typical for our company, but I know within other companies with low bio burden operations, they may choose not to select a classification assigned with the room, once you refer to it as a grade A, B, C, D, and let's talk about those lower grades, then typically the Annex 1 implications are there. So I know other areas don't refer to it as a classification. They'll refer either potentially to ISO as the reference, or they'll create a nomenclature for it, so that way they're not pinned with that Annex 1 expectation. Okay, interesting stuff. Thank you very much for that response. Um, okay, we'll move on, but there are plenty of questions to get through, so uh, we've, we've got quite a few still to go. A uh, question from, from Melanie now. Um, so I'll, it's, uh, I'll read through this a couple of times. It's, uh, it's, it's a little lengthier. So do you have any experience of how regulatory authorities see elimination of monitoring points? You mentioned non-value added monitoring in the presentation. Is the risk assessment sufficient enough to show efficiency of the program? I expect some discussion with the auditors if we step back from some of the monitoring mm -hmm. points. Um, so, so I think that question was that was actually clearer than perhaps I originally thought. Yeah. So, um, any any thoughts from uh, from the team on that? This to me is a gold star I, question. Yeah, um, that's because... what I was going to say, Don. I think yeah, because <laughs> you had that interaction. <laughs> FDA. Yeah, so so we are we definitely demonstrated and showcased the approach and received positive feedback from regulatory agencies. What I would say is much more difficult, especially if you're looking at a historical standpoint and looking at an existing facility and you go through and you execute the approach and you see areas where you say this is not a high risk location. I have historical data that shows this has never had an excursion, and I'm choosing to eliminate that location. That's where everyone gets a bit uncomfortable, but we have elected to do that. Uh, we have not had any issues to date with that, but I do recognize that comes with a lot of concern around regulatory scrutiny for eliminating a location. Yeah, the, the the only thing I, I would add is that kind of hit on the same thing Don was, right, is there's there's some anxiety around that, but I think if you utilize the data, you utilize your risk assessment from the from the document that, that you know, we went over, I think, you know, putting all of that together from a strong rationale, a strong scientific technical rationale standpoint, and you make sure it's cross-functional, it's just not one part of the organization making that decision, right, that it's truly cross-functional. You have your, your technical organization, your quality organization, operations engineering, right, saying here's how, how this is managed and have all that information um, put into a single rationale document for those those site removals. and the historical data associated with that, I think it puts you in a firm firm place, but it, it doesn't reduce that risk that again, a, an, an individual inspector can come in and, and disagree with that. And it's, how do you wanna have that conversation? And to me, the best way to have that conversation is to have the strong risk assessment that we went over um, in any data that you already have associated with that that says, hey, here's why we removed this, right? We took, 
you know, 500 samples from here and there's only one recovery in 500 samples. So therefore we believe that's a non-value added sample. All these other samples are truly value added based upon the assessment and the processes that go on in there. So I think as long as that rationale is clearly um, documented and, and, and reviewed and approved cross-functionally, it, it gives you a strong footing, I believe. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, Fred, uh, definitely you want to make sure you have robust controls in place as well to justify mm -hmm. that rationale. Yeah, yep, exactly. Okay, superb, thank you. Uh, so moving on to the next question from Darine. Um, what is the recommended frequency for risk assessment review? I jumped in. That's okay, Matthew. Um, that's you can that's add. fine. We have the same answer. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we are looking typically on the order of at least a three year cycle, but I add a caveat here. If you are executing any significant changes, then it's worth obviously incorporating that. So we would, for any major changes, go back through and review the outcomes to determine if there's any changes. I'm throwing out that three-year notion, I don't know. Fred, mm -hmm. uh, any yeah. other? The, the only thing I, I would add is, is to make sure that it's identified as something that needs to be evaluated through your change management process. You kind of hit mm -hmm. on this, Don, but just to kind of elaborate yeah. a little bit more, right? If there is a change going on, you want to make sure that it's clearly identified that this is something that needs to be evaluated for every change that's going on in the facility. And maybe it's one of those things of like, yeah, that's not a significant change. It doesn't change the risk ranking, but you need to make sure that that is clearly documented within your change management process. And then if it does, you know, if, if that change would require that to have a step to make sure that's done as part of that change. And then, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think any frequency could be okay. Um, you just need to, have that justification and rationale clearly documented mm -hmm. within your, your strategy um, um, document associated with the execution of the risk assessment. You can tell Fred's been through many regulatory uh, audits. <laughs> Those are great responses. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's game day. That's what it is. <laughs> Okay, lovely, thank you. Uh, so now we have a question from Stuart Mackay. Uh, is there a defined process for moving from an EMPQ sample to a routine monitoring sample plan? So moving from EMPQ to routine monitoring. So Scott, the question was, is there a what for moving between the two? So is, is there a defined process for moving from EMPQ samples to a, a routine monitoring plan? So the paper does provide basically recommendations and that transition point from what would be expected at the EMPQ level and then following EMPQ with leveraging that data mm -hmm. and the assessment itself, how you would transition to a lowered amount of sampling. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's more that yeah. Angie or Fred you want to add? No, you nailed it. And I think there was a you did um, there was a slide for that that talked talked about that you spoke about the high level steps for the transition from EMPQ to the routine sampling plan. Yeah, not much more I'd add. Just mm -hmm. like I said, that, that is built into the document itself. Um, yeah. And then there, Scott, I don't, I don't know if we're allowed to say this, so I apologize if I misspeak, but that is something that I think in, in some of the other items that we're working on as a workflow um, that hopefully you'll see in the near future. Yes, we, we can talk about that. I, I was saving it to the end, but we can go into the discussion. Now. I didn't get into specific, so I didn't I didn't steal your thunder, but it is something that, that we identified and we are working on as as a as a workflow and a team. So I think I think we'll get there. Yeah, absolutely. So just just for context there to, to add to, to Fred's uh, teaser there. Um, the, the team is working on a, on a guidance paper, um, I, I, I guess a similar type of an approach on uh, guidance for EMPQ for new facilities. So that, that's a paper that's in the works. It's, it's very much in the draft stage at the moment, but uh, watch the space. Uh, there's more to come from this team for sure. Uh, 
Um, but <laughs> I, I, with, with that little uh, commercial break <laughs> out of the way, um, we'll, we'll move on to the next question, um, which is, uh, is it mandatory to attach audit trail reports with particle count results? Do regulatory uh, agencies uh, accept data without an audit trail? That's an interesting question. So yeah, I I I, yeah. I can't I can't answer that one here. Um, sorry. Similarly struggling yeah. a little bit to to answer that question, Scott. Okay. Catch 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 your notes here. Yeah, so, so prize for the, the question that stumped the team, Suman, well done for that. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, th th these are topics we can, of course, take back to, to, the, to the, uh, the work stream um, to discuss, you know, uh, companies and, and individuals' experiences on this. So um, if, uh, if the team would like, we, we can certainly bring that back to our, our main discussions uh, to see if there's any experience out there to, to address that question. So thanks for the question. Apologies, we don't have an answer for you right now. But we can certainly seek to uh, to, to uh, kind of glean some experiences from from the team on that. So, uh, with apologies, we'll move on to the next question from uh, Darren. Um, what are the criteria considered to maintain a sampling point in the routine sampling plan? What are the criteria considered to maintain a sampling point in the routine sampling plan? So. I think again, we do have, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we do have recommendations um, as well in the toolkit um, that speaks to these requirements, minimum requirements for transitioning from EMPQ to routine EM sampling plan based on the output of the risk assessment. And that's yes. right, Nancy. I think its primary is that any high risk location you would expect to retain those medium risk locations that you may have sampled in ENPQ that actually revealed no excursions or very good data that might be options to remove moving forward. And then ideally we aren't sampling in any low risk locations. And most of the spaces, again, I like to keep the separation between the viable and the non-viable. Uh, since you do for qualification, you need to follow the ISO or non -viable. Yeah, and I, and I think it also depends on the results uh, that you get from the EMPQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was the only other piece I was going to add, Manchi. So, yeah. got, got to use your results to make that determination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Excellent stuff. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, it's actually, I think, a repeat um, of, a, of a previous question, or there's a frequency for risk assessment review. I think uh, we've already uh, answered that question um, for, 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 for another, uh, uh, another question earlier on, so we won't repeat that one. Um, hopefully the response there is, is okay that we had already. Um, so the next question is, how do you justify uh, short-term temperature, humidity, and differential pressure excursions from environmental monitoring, from an environmental monitoring point of view, uh, for a non-sterile product. So, for a non-sterile product, how do you justify short-term temperature, humidity, and differential pressure excursions from uh, an environmental monitoring point of view? Okay, I can start with this one. This is very specific, and it's also, I think not as close to any of the three of us since we are generally either sterile or low bio burden um, but with exposure and some level within the non-sterile i would have suggested that if you do have a temporary excursion that you would be relying on what other elements of control that you have within the space and if you do have any monitoring, so if there's limited monitoring that's occurring and you can show that those have not shown any trend, adverse trend or otherwise, those would support those momentary, I don't know if they're momentary or how long in duration, but 
smaller excursion with temperature and humidity. Yeah, there's nothing else I would add to that, Don. Good, great job. Okay, well, we have a, a, just maybe a similar question coming up next. Um, can we generate data by deliberate excursion for a certain period of time and use that data for a risk assessment? So can we generate data by a deliberate excursion for a certain period of time and use that data for risk assessment? So I, I'll, I'll give a, an answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do not believe that is the right thing to do because we design and qualify a facility to act in a certain way. And then we are gonna monitor it based upon the way that it's been designed, built and qualified to forcibly make it not handle in that way. I, I personally just don't think that's right. I mean, don't get me wrong. We have DPs, we have temperature excursions, we have, um, you know, a door doesn't work or a door stays open for longer than we expect it to or whatever. But I, I wouldn't purposely do that from an EM perspective. Um, just because it's, it's EM in its own right. And there's inherent variability within that anyway. So you you can you can do that in a certain way, but just because you see something similar doesn't mean you would get the exact same results. That and again, that's more of a personal point of view than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I do think you can use the risk assessment if something like that does occur to say here is the risk associated with that if there's a DP that occurs in this room or or if there's you know a hepa felt a hepa failure or something like that when you're doing your your hepa testing um, i think you can use the risk assessment to evaluate that but i wouldn't purposely do any of those things and again that's a personal point of view right i'm aligned with you fred i would have similarly said the same and i've actually encountered data such as that being generated and I think the problem with that is, is it's, I'll call it a slippery slope as to if that data perpetuates and other individuals, I'll say latch on to the data and not recognize the purpose of it, they may extrapolate to the point where they are leveraging that data in ways that it shouldn't be used. So justifying those excursions to the point where they're not actually taking action against them, so I I would highly caution against it as well. Nancy, it sounded like you had comments as well. Yep, seems um, just aligned with both of you, Don and Fred. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. Um, so uh, one other question here, um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is related or not, but is it acceptable to run HVAC on setback conditions? For a sterile facility now uh, not being the technical person in the room this means <laughs> hopefully this makes sense to you guys is it acceptable to run hvac on setback condition for a sterile facility probably need more would you want text yeah okay and so, so under then, what scenario yeah. would you you know would you consider yeah. setback because to me if you ran it that way i'm presuming in don't have active production. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would have a lot of questions as to why you would want to yeah. do that. Okay, yeah. well, uh, in, in that case, we'll, we'll move on to the next question while I ask uh, Suman, who asked that question, if you're able to add a little bit of context, uh, please, uh, in, in the chat, that would be really helpful. And um, we'll come back to your question uh, once we have a little bit more context there. Uh, so moving on, a uh, question from Thomas Loader. Uh, if you have a grade C formulation grid slash room, that is scored medium or high, and the assessment recommends additional testing. Is it reasonable to justify not increasing testing from what we are currently doing due to subsequent filtration steps and historical process simulation information? So you have a grade C formulation grid slash room that is scored medium or high, and the assessment recommends additional testing. Is it reasonable in the, your report uh, to justify not increasing testing from what we're currently doing due to subsequent filtration step and historical process simulation information. If, 
market is yielding a high, high, high risk medium. for uh, yeah, the high one I would have a hard time maybe assuming you're not taking any sampling in that location and you've designated as high for the risk assessment, I would have a harder time saying that it's justified to not do any additional sampling. The medium, there might be an opportunity there to support a rationale. So is this is this for the EMPQ that the question is uh, pointed towards, or it's for the routine sampling? Uh, it doesn't say. So I, I would I'm making an assumption it's for it's for routine, but that's an assumption. Always dangerous. Yeah. So I I think for routine this is something again it's a high risk, right? So definitely you want to make sure that you have all the um, locations that are high risk captured if the output of the assessment is high risk right now medium is again bit depending on your controls and your risk impact to the process you can justify it as um, Fred had mentioned earlier that again this all depends on you know how robust your justification and your rationale is to um, to, to, to support your assessment yeah the only the only thing I would add to that is is we need to remember what number one the assessment is evaluating the manufacturing environment for the risk of of that environment to potentially no, number one, have additional bio burden that can potentially get into the the product flow path, right? So, I I would say you have to remember that when you're doing those activities, that what your environmental monitoring is telling you is what's that environment look like. It's not actually a direct representation of the product itself. It's what's what's that environment look like. So you have to understand the risk assessment helps you drive that. And if you have a high risk grid even in a grade C formulation area, I agree with what Don was saying that I I would expect that you would have to have at least some kind of monitoring in that grid um, because uh, that you it would just be very difficult to have that conversation yeah. from a compliance standpoint that if you've identified something as high risk and you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, but we're not gonna do any monitoring with it anyway because of all this other stuff further down, I still think that creates a difficulty because it's about the evaluation of that manufacturing environment itself, not about the product. Unless, um, Fred and Don, just correct me if I'm wrong, for the higher risk grid, right? So I know we do have minimum requirement. So depending on the grid size, unless you have that sampling captured in the adjacent grid, right? And it's under yeah. the same functional section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? But yeah. That's true. I mean, you can, again, it's it's. I'll I'll hit my drum that I've been hitting a lot, right? It's about the rationale and how it's documented yeah. and and all that. But I think, um, like I said, I still would lean towards where Don was at. That if it is a high risk grid, it would be difficult to justify not having some sampling there. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so just a few more questions to go. Um, uh, you're doing great so far, team, so so well done. Um, so this is a question from, from Adrian Zimbelman. Um, often the EMPQ is performed, then the facility launches right into GMP. Uh, there does not seem to be enough time to analyze EMPQ results prior to moving on to routine monitoring. How can sites reconcile or justify routine monitoring uh, while waiting for EMPQ results? So I'll read through that again. Uh, often the EMPQ is performed, then the facility launches right into GMP. There does not seem to be enough time to analyze EMPQ results prior to moving on to routine monitoring. How can sites reconcile or justify routine monitoring while waiting for EMPQ results? I believe in the I believe in the toolkit we actually have a portion that kind of speaks to that a little bit of that that transition. Um, Definitely of the transition. I guess the limitation sounds. Yeah, I just would say the limitation sounds like they're actually moving forward without the EMPQ results and incorporating that into considerations for the routine. So which, I could. 
Yeah, yeah it's a good point, Don. So I, I could see maybe not having the viable, but you're definitely going to have the non-viable because, I mean, that information right. is readily right. available, right? So so from a risk-based okay. approach, you technically, I mean, you, as, again, I'm going to hit my drum again, as long as you're documenting and the rationale is clearly articulated that that you're moving from, you know, your, your sampling is risk-based and you're taking the non-viable or to, I don't actually don't like the term non-viable total particle data and to, you know, to move forward in the GMP and then you're going to be evaluating that viable data as it starts coming off. Um, I mean, technically, yeah, you could, you can do that. And I think again, Don Manchi, please correct me. I, I, I think the document, the, the toolkit kind of, has that transition now you'd have to infer that that part there but i think it it helps with that transition right it does have that yeah. bridge with the transition i think the for me i have i think exactly what you said fred with the right rationale etc i would be less familiar though with not actually having that data before moving especially with a, a new facility before yeah. moving into routine yeah, for a new new facility, it's different compared to the existing facility because there you can have a lot of other inputs as well. If you want to move into GMP, because you can take into consideration your historical data, your existing controls, which you've already had and all that. The other thing that you could do, right, is is you could do that monitoring and then you could go into a phase where you're doing like um water fills or mimic the process right for, yeah. for qualification purposes or things like that right so it's mm -hmm. it's kind of like a gmp state but not mm -hmm. really right so you can kind of i mean that would be another piece and that's not necessarily documented in the toolkit but i think that's another piece of that transition that you could think about of how do you use that time frame between all of the samples being taken that data coming off right Bef between that and the summary being written, right? You could use that time frame to do some of those, some of those activities as well. Mm -hmm. Or I guess maybe Fred to add to that, because I'm assuming this is all about speed. So this is looking to get to GMP manufacturing as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. like, of course, it could is. also <laughs> take a less a less aggressive approach, and you could take more samples than you traditionally mm -hmm. would for routine for those initial batches and with the known intent and put that rationale up front mm -hmm. that you would pull back after you've received all results and even those first I don't know how many batches and they're all showing good results that you could go to that normal yeah. reduced routine plan. And then the other thing I mean this is what what even I've seen that what they do if if there is a rush into moving into GMP and as you know mesophilic microorganisms if if they are growing right they grow within 24 to 48 hours so sometimes they even take into consideration the pre-read of the plates and that is something that even they put in the justification for the initial incubation temperature. Yeah. Yeah, you could. I agree, Manchi. You could build that yeah. in there, and then you could also build into the protocol, mm -hmm. like what Don was talking about, which is what, what we've done in items is have like what interim monitoring, right? So it's not mm -hmm. full blown EMPQ monitoring, it's but it's not routine monitoring either. It's like this this middle area where you're doing additional sampling than you'll probably be doing in routine, but um, you know that that's another good way to to handle it. So I think there's a couple different options there that that you you could take the risk assessment that gives you the the locations the the you know recommended frequency and the recommended sampling methodologies and then take that and and modify it slightly not what you'd have at routine but slightly more than that yeah okay wonderful T two more questions still still to go um so this next question is at our site non-viable sampling is performed once per week and not at the same time as viable sampling uh, so at our site non-viable sampling is performed once per week and not at the same time as viable sampling is this typical for a low bio burden drug substance site
I think again, this this depends the frequency of sampling. Again, it depends <clears throat> on the layout of the facility and the process and the risks involved, right? So, I, I don't think so. There is anything that's kind of set on stone. And correct me if I'm wrong. That you know, non-viable must be performed only once a week. Again, this this all depends on the output of your risk assessment. Yeah, or that they need to be together. I wouldn't necessarily say that's a mandate by any means. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that too, Don. It's not a mandate. I mean, that's just an efficiency. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. If if you have a environmental monitoring person out there doing one type of sampling, you know, for instance, total particles, right, where you just activate a machine and it runs and then it's like oh hey while i'm out here i can take these other samples too i mean that's just you know operational um efficiency so i don't think there's anything that mandates they have to be done at the same time just that they would have to be done Marvelous, thank you. Um, and one qu this question relates to a process in a closed system. Um, thoughts on a non-GMP AHU feeding a classified GMP area. So thoughts on a non-GMP air handling unit feeding a no uh, feeding a classified GMP area. Scott, you said non-classified GMP area, right? So, sorry, I'm not. Thoughts on a non a non-GMP air handling unit feeding a classified GMP area, the process is okay. closed system. I think that would open you up for some compliance risks, to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah, I agree with Brad. You you might be able to build out a rationale. Now, now taking Fred's typical stance here, uh, <laughs> to build out the rationale to support that, I do think, though, from a compliance standpoint, there is a risk there. Yeah, sometimes you can write awesome rationale, and it's still awesome. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Again, it depends it depends on the regulator, though. Yeah, uh, completely. <laughs> Agree with that 100%. So, I mean, it, it's all about the risk tolerance, right, And and having that rationale built build into the process mm -hmm. some of us live on the edge and some of us don't <laughs> okay uh, the, the last question isn't actually a question um it, it, it i think it's part of, also a response to uh, to one of the previous questions which uh, relates to i think um switching over from empq to routine in the comment is just that we use all pq points until the initial pq is completed then evaluate and establish the routine based on all of that data. Um, so that, that feeds into one of the previous questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, brings us to the end. Oh, hang on. No, we have another question just in, last gasp. Um, so, so thank you for that question. Um, this, this might take you uh, kind of off at a tangent. What are your thoughts on quarterly fungal monitoring with SDA? And of course, I'm not sure what SDA is. Hopefully, that means more to you. But what are your thoughts on quarterly fungal monitoring with SDA? These are great questions, by the way. Um, so, right, I'm guessing too, you probably have comments to this as well. So, I don't believe that it's necessary. I think we can show that we have good recovery with our current media. I, I know though there has been regulatory scrutiny in this space and this is somewhat regulator specific. So I'm gonna start high level there and maybe bridge to Fred or Manji. Yeah, so I I, I mean, I, I would say yes, it's, it's regulator specific. I can think of a couple off the top of my head. Um, and you know i i think it's also again understanding your process and understanding the risk associated with that and then making sure that you have a ro robust 
strategy around your growth promotion of your EM media um, mm -hmm. to demonstrate, you know, you ha you can recover um, organisms that would typically be identified in your manufacturing area based upon the conditions and the processes that occur um, with the understanding that we are not going to, we are not going to ever be able to recover and grow 100% of everything that is in every single environment. Yeah. And maybe a teaser too to that effort that we alluded to with the ENPQ. There is, I know, discussion in draft already on this topic in that paper that we're working towards. That's a good, that actually is a really good final question though. Whoever, whoever tossed that little <laughs> time out there, that was pretty sweet. <laughs> it is because it ties us up quite nicely for the EMPQ. However, yeah. I have to say there is, there is another question that's coming. So um, <laughs> apart, apart from some, some very pleasant comments, thanking you for your, for, for your presentations. Um, so the, the, I think this one relates as well. Actually, it's a, it's a comment. I think if sites have validation to show fungal recovery with TSA, then that should be acceptable. Um, and this uh, particular uh, individual has defended that with regulators. So um, uh, I, think, I think that does kind of support what uh, what you were just saying there. So so thank you. Yeah. Um, so yes, that tees us up quite nicely for, for, for the, the, the next series of webinars. Watch the space about this time next year when we will potentially be, uh, be running a similar webinar, webinar on our yeah, guidance for EMPQ. Um, one more question uh, for, from Noel. Oh, hi, Noel. Long time since, since we've spoken. I hope you're well. Um, what do you think about using EM data to justify the failure of a pre preventative control during a deviation review and batch release decision? So I'll, I'll look back again. What do you think about using EM data to justify the failure of a preventative control during a deviation review and batch release decision? thoughts scott that's like putting your head on the chopping block man <laughs> well i'm putting your head on the chopping block here so uh, no. I, I, feel, uh, I feel quite comfortable so yeah so the don manchi I'll, I'll go first if you guys don't mind i i think it depends on on what failed and because I'll, I'll, I'll give my personal opinion here right environmental monitoring is is an indirect measure of a lot of things and a direct measure of I won't say nothing, but pretty close to it, right? So it's 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 a measure of a whole bunch of things, right? That that you have built in your your infrastructure and and your infrastructure maintenance as it relates to your contamination control strategy and your processes, and how people are managed and and materials moved around and all that. But it's it's really not a direct measure of like a one hundred percent direct measure of of things as you know where you know some of our engineering brethren you know they're measuring they're monitoring things that are direct measures of of something right and em really isn't like that it's 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 an indirect measure of a whole bunch of things so i think to use it to as a singular justification i don't think is appropriate it's how do you use your contamination control strategy and everything that's built in there to evaluate when you do have a failure of a, a a preventative or mitigative um, process because you know that goes back to the classic Swiss cheese model right you have a lot of things to to catch that net and if one thing fails it doesn't mean everything in it is bad unless it's you know unless you're talking about a drug product and it's a it's a filter failure then that's a different kind of conversation but other processes right I think you have to identify what failed and then what, uh, what is all of the other stuff associated with your contamination control strategy that you have mm -hmm. um, to make that evaluation? It's just not EM on itself, so. I agree with you that you have to take a look at the big picture, right? Like what all is involved and not just point towards one thing, which is EM. Yeah, you nailed it. Yep, well answered, yep. Okay. 
Fantastic. Well, well, that takes us to the end of the questions. Uh, and thank you to, to everyone who, who asked questions. There are a great many of you there um, asking some, uh, some, some quite challenging questions. So, so many, many thanks for that. Um, it certainly makes me happy to see the team put under a little bit of pressure there with, uh, with some of your tough questions. It reassures me that they, they know what they're talking about, which is, which is, which is always good. Um, that's not the end of the story, of course. Uh, so, so the presentation um, but by, by Fred Manchi and by Don, um, it will be recorded. It should be made available to uh, to anyone who who is uh, who is interested in that, and available from uh, bioforum.com. Uh, there is a section on that website for the environmental monitoring work stream. Um, there, you will also find the the risk assessment document that, uh, that the team have presented on today. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to, to Bioforum generally through that website or to me directly. I, I, as the facilitator of the work stream, I've just dropped my, my email address into the chat box. Um, I am not a technical expert. I am just the facilitator for this team. Mm -hmm. um, the expertise lies um, with the uh, with the team presenting today and also the rest of the work stream uh, who, who are uh, also um, intimately involved in this work and uh, it's, it's a very much a collaborative effort and uh, uh, as, as I think as Fred said in the introduction has, has taken in um, subject matter experts from over 20 uh, member companies. Um, so that just leaves uh, me to say thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks again to, my, to the presenters um, uh, for, for the presentation and for, uh, for answering your questions. Thank to all of you, for, as I say, for your attendance and for your questions and engagement. Um, that is it for, from us today. Um, as I say, look out for the, for the recording, uh, which will be sent out once it's available and reliably informed. Um, and I just leave it to me to, to, to thank you all again and to wish you a great day. Um, and uh, also, uh, given as it's Friday, uh, wishing you a, a very enjoyable weekend as well. So uh, on behalf of the team, thank you all. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll meet again at a webinar like this at some point in the future again. Thank you indeed and uh, good day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank